Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Leela Fernandez, Director of the Jackson School of International Studies, and I'd like to, to welcome you uh, to our event today. I'd like to begin by saying that the Jackson School acknowledges that we are in Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and other indigenous peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, First Nations, and indigenous peoples across the world. So today's event is the last um, uh, in our lecture series for winter quarter, uh, the series Protest, Race, and Citizenship Across African Worlds, sponsored by the Henry Jackson School of International Studies and the African Studies Program, in partnership with the Center for Global Studies, Comparative History of Ideas, Near Eastern Languages and Civilization, Simpson Center for the Humanities, and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Since today, today is the last event um, of, of our um, uh, of, of the winter ser series, um, I'd like to uh, just give my, my um, continued thanks to Danny Hoffman, a chair of the African Studies Program, for all of the work that he did, um, both intel intellectual and logistical, in, in organizing this entire series. Um, and to thank Monica Rojas also for all the support that she uh, produ uh, provided through the African Studies Program. Um, and finally, last but definitely not least, my, my deepest thanks to Monique Thur Thurman and also to Sarah, Sarah Greenberg for all the behind scenes work that they, they do to make these events a real success. Um, so let me now uh, turn to introduce um, uh, Hamza Zafar, who's going to introduce our speaker as well as um, serve as, um, uh, as our discussant today. Hamza Zafar is Associate Professor of Arabic and Islamic Studies in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization. He is a specialist in pre-modern Arabian and African languages and textual traditions around the Red Sea. His teaching at the university includes a course in classical Ethiopic. He's the author of Ecumenical Community, Language and Politics of the Ummah in the Quran, uh, published in 2020 by Brill Press. And it's a history of the Quran's um, community forming, forming language. He just received the Katz Fellowship for Advanced Judaic Studies at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania for the coming year to work on his current research project, Matriarchs of Medina, Muhammad's Wives, Mothers and Daughters in the Early Muslim Sources. Uh, Professor Zafar, Zafar uh, received his PhD in Near Eastern Studies at Cornell in 2014. And he was one of the co-founders of the Horn of Africa Initiative at the UW and the series exists in part because of that work. Thank you, Hamza, so much. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Leela, for this introduction. Uh, Santin, please turn on your video and audio now. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, all of you today, Eleni Santin Zeleka, Assistant Professor of African Studies in the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies at Columbia University in New York City. Before Columbia, I've just found out, Santin was at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington State. Santin did her BA at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and received her doctoral training at the Graduate Program in Social and Political Thought at York University in Toronto. Her research interests include vernacular politics in the Horn of Africa, critical theory, the Frankfurt School, and the problem of con constituting Africa as an object of study. Santin's first book titled Ethiopia in Theory, Revolution and Knowledge Production, 1964 to 2016, was part of Brill's historical materialism book series and was just published as paperback by Haymarket Books. Ethiopia in Theory examines the literature of the 1960s and 70s Ethiopian student movement, together with the movement's afterlife in contemporary Ethiopian politics. True to her interdisciplinary training, Santim's work offers a convincing critique of the social and political sciences and represents, in my view, a bold inquisition of how these disciplines have transformed knowledge production in the Horn of Africa. I invite scholars and students in our community who are interested in learning about the Horn of Africa, African political thought, critical theory, and the history of capitalism to pay close attention to Santim's supradisciplinary work. Today's talk is titled Ethiopia in Theory, Theory as, a, as Memoir. Santim, welcome to the University of Washington and to the Seattle and Pacific Northwest community. Welcome back, I should say. We are very yeah. pleased to have you. Thank you so much for that very wonderful introduction. That was amazing. I was like, what, I do all of those things? How cool is that? 
Um, I see you're disappearing from the screen and I am left alone on the Zoom to continue talking um, and I shall try and do that. Um, so I just would like to thank the audience for coming today. I'd like to thank Danny Hoffman and Hamza for inviting me uh, to do this talk at UW. Um, I'm excited to do the talk because I think that in writing this particular talk today, it helped clarify some ideas that I had um, that are in the book, Ethiopia in Theory. But um, I guess the book now exists as a kind of object and um, this talk is reflecting both on the book and perhaps um, intimating the direction in which my research is going. Um, so I do want to talk about the book. Um, I want to talk about why it's important and what are some of the debates that the book is hoping to intervene in. Um, but today, what I really want to do is concentrate on this idea of Tizita um, as the overall conceptual framework for my book and as a way to, I suppose, critique um, the social sciences um, that the mainstream social sciences. So, um, so let's see, let's, let's start with, um, I suppose my PowerPoint, I should share my screen. Uh, so let's do that. Um, so one of the things I would say, um, okay, I, I wanna go into presentation mode here. Oh my goodness. Um, all right, I'm not sure how to get it back into presentation mode because technology is odd. So I'm not going to try and do that. You'll just have to bear with me and watch my sl slides as they are. So one of the things that I do want to just point out is that um, my book is concerned with, I guess, three overall things. Um, on the one hand, I'm asking, what does it mean to write about the appropriation and indigenization of Marxist and mainstream social science ideas in an African and an Ethiopian context? Secondly, the book asks, what does the archive of revolutionary thought in Africa teach us about the practice of critical theory more generally? And I think the third and probably the most important part of the book is asking if tisita, the Amharic term for memory and nostalgia, as well as a musical form of lament, whether this term can serve as a kind of conceptual tool for organizing stories that we tell about the Ethiopian revolution. So in today's talk, I, as I said already, I wanna focus on this third question that animates my book. And I wanna show how thinking about Tizita connects to the question of what Africa can teach us about the practice of critical theory more generally. Um, the second part of the talk will then focus on how the concept of Tizita itself helps us to more concretely address the problem of the African social sciences within an actual political economy and why this matters in terms of just thinking about politics in Ethiopia um, more broadly. So let me, let me also preface my comments by pointing out that one of the reasons that I want to focus on this idea of Tizita for this talk is because Ethiopia is once again mired in a kind of stalled revolution and in a civil war. And I think one of, the thing, one of the things that war asks us to do is to fall into a kind of sectarian uh, position. Um, so what I want to suggest alternatively is that Tizita is a method that allows me to sustain an analysis of the current situation um, and to sustain that, that analysis beyond a sectarian position, what, but also at the same time not falling into the trap of neutrality. And so I want us to think about what that might look like. You know, what, is, what does it mean to not fall into uh, sectarianism and not to fall into the trap of neutrality? And what is it that the social sciences can't do when it tries to be objective? Um, so why Tizita? As mentioned already, Tizita simply means memory um, or nostalgia, but it's also a genre of music and it also refers to a musical scale. So Amharic is a playfully polysemic language. Words can mean multiple things at the same time. But I will say that one thing that has always struck me growing up in an Ethiopian household about Tizita is that the song is always referring to a lost love. 
So if some of you, when you were coming into the room, uh, the Zoom room today, you might have heard um, a song playing that's a kind of typical uh, Tizita song. Um, so some of the, you know, an exemplary lyric um, in a Tizita song would be something like, my Tizita is you, I don't have Tizita, you say you're coming, yet you never do. So we could translate that perhaps as my memory is you, I don't have memory, you say you're coming, yet you never do. But here we see that the song refers to both the loss of form and the loss of content. I don't have you, therefore I don't have memory, or I don't have memory, therefore I don't have you. So what I think Tizita really allows me to think about are the ways in which we experience the past as always in relationship to the forms in which the past is given to us, but where the form itself is always unstable. So for instance, in the song that you just listened to, you might hear lyrics that go something like, outdoing yesterday, shouldering on today, borrowing from tomorrow, renewing yesteryears, comes Tizita, hauling possessions. Here in this verse, the, thought, the, the song is teaching us a number of things. It's teaching us at least five things. First, we see that me the memory of the lover can overwhelm the container that holds the memory. Uh, second, the song also instructs us to think about the genres and forms through which the past has come down to us as an inheritance. Third, the song suggests that there is some kind of gap between living with the past and inheriting the past. Fourth, history exists at a kind of uncanny level, and it means that the past can erupt into the present in unpredictable ways. So lastly, what this asserts about the past is that the past is not just a linear movement, but is often a kind of untimely interference. So what the method of Tizita allows us to capture, allows me to capture, is how the past erupts, as I said, in this untimely way. And in my own writing, I'm also trying to capture what I've inherited from an earlier generation of student activists, of revolutionary student activists. Yet even as I position myself as the daughter of the Ethiopian revolution, knowledge of the revolution is always opaque to me. It is something that I can grab at in terms of a lost love, but the form through which this lost love is, you know, is given to me is never quite there for me. I cannot really behold the lover. So there's this constant struggle in my writing around this question of how to get at the thing that I want to get at. Um, and so what Tizita is drawing our attention to are the multiple valences, these multiple valences through which difficult writing actually happens. And it suggests a method for how to adopt a form of writing that matches that difficulty. So for example, I wrote Ethiopian, in th Ethiopian theory primarily in Toronto, the daughter of Ethiopian immigrants in a city with a large immigrant population from the Horn of Africa. While writing the book, I had very little professional ambitions. I simply wanted to understand the situation of revolutionary Ethiopia. And here I'm referring to the 1974 revolution and its aftermath. But in trying to understand the revolution, I spent a lot of time in my attic in Toronto being quiet and not doing very much. I would just sit there and conjure the past. But my time in the attic was also about meditating on how the past itself was present in that attic as an experience of longing and loss. More importantly, however, I was also interested in the fact that loss was something that I could not vanquish. All I could conjure was a relationship with loss that invited an engagement with things that were not present. But these things were, not none, were, were nonetheless bearing down on me. So the things that were not present still bear down on me, on my body, on my sense of who I am in the world. And so the past was present, even though it was invisible. So my time in the attic was first off an engagement with invisibility. Um, so in this attic, I also spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to write history and how our relationship to the past is often mystified. 
There are, of course, all of these debates that we are all familiar with about how we can go to the archive and find the past and represent it as a kind of object to our readers. But that was not my sense of what it meant to write history. For me to write history was to engage, again, in these traditions of how the past is passed down to me. In so doing, I understood the past existed as a mode of transmission primarily rather than just an object that could be self-evidently presented. So I call my book um, a memoir or theory as memoir. It's an academic book. It's a book of critical theory and history. And yet I call it a memoir. So I think, why am I doing that? I think what critical theory is doing in this book is engaging with my experience of loss as well as my sense of the past as memory. But critical theory was also a way to translate that memory into some kind of shared human knowledge while also submitting to the limits of human knowledge. To me, these are also the valences on which Tizita is engaging the past. So here I am primarily thinking about the past as a web of relationships that connects me to other historically situated and embodied persons. What it means to write about the past is not to talk so what it means to write about the past is to talk about the ways in which those relationships that I have with other people have come to possess me. People from my present, people from the past, et cetera, the ways in which they, those relations have come to possess my body. But it also meant that I had to think about the contingencies of human knowledge based on that possession. Um, so in that sense, I think I, I did write the book very much against the idea that exists in African studies that you can write history as a usable past. So usable past is a term that gets floated around in a lot of like post-colonial uh, literature, um, particularly again in African studies. And I think what usable past as a term asserts is this idea that you can go um, and construct a history of Africa that can somehow um, reassert African pride and reassert um, a way of, of being African that is you know, in defiance of imperialism. Um, I, I've always found that term really, really problematic because it has a very instrumental approach to knowledge. And it, it tells us what knowledge is supposed to be even before the knowledge production has actually begun. So, I really wanted another way of doing African social sciences or African humanities. And for me, that began with thinking again about this body of mine as this place where I can pull out the universal. Here, what I am suggesting is that if the particular is the sedimentation of all things that have happened, so as to produce me, then the particular is the, is the sedimentation of a set of relationships. So the attendant sense of loss that I experienced in my body around the Ethiopian revolution allowed me to get away from rooting any notion of obligation in some kind of moralistic necessity. And this was, this was really necessary to because I wanted to get away from this idea of a usable past. Um, and, I, and, and so in order to get away from that usable past, I wanted to uncover the universal through my own body. And, and I think, to a large degree, my work here is um, in conversation with Raymond Williams and his book, Marxism and Literature, where he talks about affect and feeling and sentiment as not just personal experiences, but are expressions of a communal experience as well. So by starting with the, the body or my body, I'm able to situate myself. And in so being situated, I'm able to ask good questions about, um, you know, questions that emerge from a particular structure of feeling. So what I'm suggesting here is that if theory can be a form of memoir, it is, it is because my body has no discrete boundaries. Um, I'm therefore proposed, you know, in the book, I propose that the history of general elections or the history of capitalism is also my body. So in that sense, memoir for me is actually a way of decentering myself or at least decentering the self that is bounded in time and space. And instead, I'm trying to focus more on my relations with others. 
memoir here is not narcissistic. Instead, I'm thinking about my shared history with others. So methodologically, again, for me, in terms of the Horn of Africa, I think this is my kind of anti-war pro-peace method. Specifically, I'm not asking how we in the Horn of Africa can live together in the future yet to come. I'm asking how we are living together right now. More importantly, I'm asking how does this living together constitute my body? Of course, it goes without saying that here relationality always includes a relation to violence and domination, and that these two are constitutive of my relations with others. So this, this is not a romantic notion of relationality at all. Um, moreover, the method is not just about me and my attic recovering from a certain kind of inheritance. It's again about a debate that's been happening within African studies itself and that is centered around what it means to decolonize African studies. As we all know, there's all these debates about African studies and African philosophy and whether we can go back to recovering indigenous languages as a mode of scientific inquiry. But for me, on some levels, all of those debates are beside the point because they, know, they don't actually deal with the present personal and political circumstances in which people live and produce knowledge. In any case, as Tizita teaches me, there is no past that is an object that you can just go back to and hold up and lob against you know, the imperialist or the oppressor. And I think this is why the debates in African studies around decolonizing knowledge seem to be very circular for me. Instead, my book attempts to get out of this impasse and discover a new way or a different way. Maybe not so new because Tizita obviously is not new. And in trying to discover this, this alternative path, what I'm doing is what is suggested by the lyrics I read earlier, outdoing yesterday, shouldering on today, borrowing from tomorrow, renewing yesteryears, you know, hauling my possessions of memory. All right, so let's move to part two of the talk then. Um, so now that, I guess, now that you have some familiarity with the concept of Tizita, let me come at this by more concretely addressing the problem of African social sciences within an actual political economy and within an international system. To do this, what I want to uh, begin with is thinking with Mahmoud Mamdani's book, Citizen and Subject, Contemporary Africa and the Legacy of Late Colonialism. It's a you know, profound book that was published in the late 1990s. Um, in Ma uh, Mahmoud's book, he suggests that African social sciences tend to be polarized around two clear tendencies, you know, on the one hand, we have communitarians, and on the other hand, we have modernists. In the modernist camp, we find a body of scholarship that's obsessed with the idea of civil society, and that tends to be anti-tribal and anti-traditional. And these modernists tend to discuss social justice primarily through, you know, the rubric of universal human rights. On the other side, we have the communitarians who want to go back to the source, they're Afrocentric, and they tend to champion a scholarship that is about cultural heritage and the cultural capacity of Africans. And so what Mahmoud's book attempts to do is to not, not reject either of these positions, but to sublate both of these positions, to, 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 combine, to combine both of these positions at, to, in order to transcend them. And he achieves this this by showing the forms through which Africa is described as being rooted in a colonial language. And so this language of modernist versus uh, communitarian modernist versus, um, you know, the, the champion of African cultural heritage, he, he says that that dichotomy itself is rooted in a kind of colonial knowledge system. And we need to actually overcome that binary in order to move on um, and to think more deeply about act actual African political realities. Um, so, and I think, but what he's doing is he's linking forms of knowing with for forms of governance, right? So this is not just like something you can like think by yourself. You need to, 
you need to actually track the ways in which we know each other through categories that are actually forms of governing Africans. Um, so one of the things I think that Mahmoud is doing then is that he is suggesting that the origins of civil society in Africa are not the result of processes of commodification in the ways that we tend to think of civil society in the West, right? The citizen is not an abstract worker shorn of obligations to family and land and other extra economic affiliations, which is how we tend to think about the citizen, you know, it, from the French Revolution moving forward, right? Um, because of the ways in which capitalism creates these doubly free subjects, free from social obligation, free to sell your labor wherever you want or however you can, right? So rather in Africa, you know, what we know is that everyday production in Africa is governed through customary, uh, you know, or political customary law or through politically constituted property rights. So in Africa, what we know is that the language of tribe and custom and the language of civil society are actually twin concepts. But while civil society has these universal pretensions, the tribe is seen as parochial and fleeting is that which must become universal. So what I think is great about Mamdani's work is that it helps us raise cru crucial questions about the relationship of capital to labor and of the history of capitalism to democracy. So if we think about you know, a typical Western European society, what we can say is that social sciences at best become the sciences of the forces imminent to civil society. The sciences of those who have been shorn of their obligations in extra through extra economic coercion. But more importantly, I think the social sciences is, is a kind of neutral arbiter of those relationships contained within civil society. But what does it mean to speak of civil society in a place like Ethiopia with 80% of the population still you know, employed or still engaged with smallholder agriculture, primarily farming on land that they have user rights to? What, what is civil society in that context? Um, I think obviously what we, what we can say here is that in Ethiopia, capitalism reproduces itself through extra economic forces or through politically constituted property relations. So following Mamdani, what I would say about all of this is that civil society in Africa is a form of power rooted in urban areas and obsessed with itself as a kind of anti-tribal and anti-traditional uh, entity. Uh, but it, in fact, it has none of the historical attributes of a European civil society. If this is true though, um, most of the comparative political and economic questions that the social sciences ask about Africa will inevitably lead us to a dead end unless we can account for actual existing African developmental trajectories. So first and foremost, then I want to acknowledge that the liberal that liberal democracy and civil society as they appear in the West are not what they are in the global South and, and they're rarely the space of progress um, that they might be in in the West right um, and that this actually has everything to do with the nature of production in 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 Africa in Ethiopia in the global South. Um, so the point here is that private property relations in uh, Africa are not the primary legal relation that secures the reproduction of capitalism. Rather, the domination of capitalist social relations in Africa is more likely to be found in the complicated relationship between statutory law and so-called and the so-called customary. But both land and labor here are, are being treated as a set of interlocking obligations and relations and the struggle over those relations often come in the form or in the demand for either the reform of the customary, so modernization, or in the struggle for decentralization, the promotion of ethnic autonomy. But what none of these, the, not, what, what this dichotomy or the swinging back and forth between the demand for modernization or the demand for ethnic autonomy, what, what this does not resolve is the fact that cultural identity in Africa is the form through which relationships between the capitalist market and the non-market are mediated. So I want to argue that the wound of the cultural in Africa 
is that is it is actually the site where extra economic coercion is fought over and negotiated, not in some narrowly reductionist manner, but since the but because since the 19th century, the customary and the tribal have become the place where market coercion is actually advanced. So the problem with civil society in Africa, oh, I think I'm supposed to change my slide here, um, right. So the problem with civil society in Africa is not that it separates the economic from the political, so as to continually recreate the space of bourgeois neutrality, but that it actually has to deny the social differences that are rooted in the way indigeneity, ethnicity, and the native have been historically constructed and reproduced for the sake of colonialism and capitalism. The consequence of this is that bourgeois seeming institutions, instead of fun functioning as neutral peacemakers, reproduce a form of power that draws out the differences we have mentioned so that formal democratic institutions become anti-democratic machines. Unarmed with or indifferent to a theory of the history of capitalism, many contemporary social science researchers in Africa become part of a social process that justifies attempts to reconstitute the human as a self-maximizing individual, something that in reality, only very specific capitalist social relations can create. So at the ideological level, for me, most social science researchers become the equivalent of the social theorist who assumes the freedom of that doubly free abstract worker as a universal goal. And at the epistemological level, the researcher assumes bourgeois freedom as both the condition and the goal of their intellectual activity, despite whatever personal claims are made to the contrary. <coughs> So Tisita then is an alternative social science practice that both critiques African social sciences as I've described it above, but it does not fall back on a relative, relativist position where all knowledge becomes equally valid. Instead, instead, on a landscape of the dead and dying, I retrieve intimations of a life which once was, my Tisita. Here, the critic can hint at the hidden language that embodies the fundamental unity of nature, the human and the world, the loss of Tisita. On a barren historical landscape, human actors can write new meanings out of that which once was. Here, there is no critical fabulation, no rescuing of the pre-colonial, but staying with silence. Through writing, the fragments of the world are blown out of the continuum of progressive time into a space where the fragments are then rescued. New beginnings are then possible. Lastly then, one point I wish to be clear about is that the current war in Ethiopia shares continuity with the late 19th, 19th century African state and the contemporary African state as, de as depicted in Mamdani's book, Citizen and Subject. While advocates of the war believe that violence will allow them to make a break from the dichotomies of state formation that have troubled Africa ever since its incorporation into the international state system, what this current war continues to show us is that the dichotomies between a communitarian and an ultra-modernist position remain at the heart of state formation processes in the Horn of Africa. What then is the role of the intellectual in the context of war? On the one hand, it is my belief that we are here to reveal these longer continuities of state formation and fragmentation. This then is to follow the road of Tisita and to demand more thought, not less. As John Berger writes about another war in another time, who still on a battlefield wants a monument? Thank you. I'm done. <laughs> thank you, Santim. All right. Uh, thank you for talking to us about how you wrote this book, uh, Ethiopian Theory, and providing us a little bit more background about your own process. Uh, it was a rich and fascinating uh, talk. Also, congratulations on this project that has already attracted so much attention and excitement. Mm. For me, your writing 
uh, even your interdisciplinarity represents in some ways a diasporic sensibility, which I really love. And I see it as an attempt, and I would say a successful attempt to chart out new paths for us to produce and circulate knowledge within the rubrics and limitations of the Western Academy. Uh, it's a pity that we weren't able to gather in person for your talk, but at the same time, I know that this online interface allows greater access to more in our community to hear and engage with scholars such as you. Uh, the University of Washington community, both on campus and beyond, includes many who are part of the Horn diaspora or adjacent to that community through kinship and shared spaces. So I know that your talk will resonate with many of us who are watching right now and who will watch in the future. And for those in the audience, I just want to remind you, you can post your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. But before I hand the mic over, I have a little bit of time. I have so many questions to ask you, but I'll limit myself uh, to two that I hope you can address. Um, first, I was really quite captivated by your use of Tizita as this, um, what do you call an alternative social science practice and your conceptualization of the past as a set of relationships that you say uh, possess you as ghosts possess a body. I can see how this is allowing you to think about the contingencies of human knowledge, including knowledge about Africa in potentially emancipatory ways. My first question is about the Tizita lyrics that you shared as an example of why this framing has been useful for you, which you explained allowed you to understand how history exists at an uncanny level as unpredictable and memory as what you called an untimely interference. So whereas I think I understand memory of the past in this way as interference, can you parse for us what you mean by it being untimely? I felt hearing your talk today that this ghost visitation, this interruption, or this tizita hauling possessions is in fact quite timely. After all, you are a scholar at an American institution delving into a revolutionary archive of, student, of a student movement tied to the Horn of Africa. And this is at a time that students of Horn heritage are at the forefront of student activism on our college campuses, including here at the University of Washington. So really this is an open-ended question, which is I want you to share your thoughts about the timeliness or untimeliness of your remembering the Ethiopian revolution and your process of developing this knowledge about it and doing, as you say, this difficult writing. My second question is oh, not about the past. Oh, sorry, should I pause? Well, that was a lot right there. Right? That was a lot right there. <laughs> let me let me let me give you your, my second question, and then you can you can address it as you wish. It's open ended. I just want to hear you think through this material. Uh, it's it's not so much about the past, really. It's about the future. I just want you to share a little bit about how your project on um, theory as memoir and your grappling with African social science. If you could tell us a little bit about how this work is informing and shaping your current project which I understand is on Addis Ababa. Can you share some of the main questions or categories that are occupying your thoughts these days? And specifically, can you tell us about how the theoretical and methodological frameworks that you've developed in this first fascinating project, how they're allowing you or empowering you to approach this next set of complex questions in your scholarly journey? I hope that's not too much. You can pick and choose as you go. Thank you. Sure, Thank sure. You. Um... Uh, let me just put up my little pictures because I like having pictures. Wait, is my is my my screen is not being shared anymore? I need to put put that back up. All right, let me do that. Uh, so okay, you asked me about the 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 project being timely and untimely. So the project does feel timely in a way. It it, it feel like it arrived right at the right at at the right moment. Um, you know. I think the paperback came out, um, you know, probably on the same day that um, the war was declared in the north, um, or around, uh, you know, give or take a few days, um, and um, or the law enforcement operation, I guess, depending on what you want to call it. Um, so, in in that sense, I feel like the book um, speaks to a history of how we got here. Um, in that sense, it's very timely. The untimely part is that um, I certainly didn't predict that there was going to be a war. <laughs> um, and there's no sense of that in the book itself, although there's a sense of, uh, of a state fracturing and a political project fracturing. And so I, th I think the book is useful for 
trying to understand the, our moment today. But um, I, I think, you know, the, the untimely, untimeliness is important for me because um, what I'm trying to get at is the ways in which um, history calls upon you um, or the past calls upon you uh, and, and, and possesses you despite the fact that you might not want to deal with a particular kind of past um, or you might want to reject a, a history. Um, and, and I think that's why I keep on using the, the term uncanny because I'm really trying to think of Freud's uncanny and the ways in which Freud is thinking about how, you know, in all of our neurotic gestures and all of the ways that we act in the world, we're actually reproducing things from the past that are unconscious to us, right? And so part of what I'm trying to get at with this notion of, of the uncanny or the untimely is the ways in which our present uh, political situation in Ethiopia is um, the result of um, repressed histories or repressed um, narratives, right? That are that are constantly bubbling up in ways that are, that um, might not be predicted or that are quite untimely, right? Mm -hmm. it's untimely for those who um, think that they can manage their body or whether it's their personal body or the the the, the body politic, right? Um, yeah. So there's right. there's a sense that they can manage that, but despite all of that kind of tech technocratic efforts to um, to manage the body, uh, the past keeps on bubbling up, right? Um, which is why the, 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 the military solution becomes, when the technocratic solution no longer works, the military solution becomes the option, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the, the future project. Yes. Um, the future project is really trying to think about Addis Ababa, the capital city of Ethiopia and to think about multiple histories of displacement that are embodied in, um, in that city, right? Um, mm. So I have an earlier project called Addis Ababa's Modernist Ruin. And in that project, I'm trying to think about all of the different layers um, through which the, the history of modern Ethiopia can be, can be read literally through the, through the physical, uh, you know, kind of architecture and, and land of the city, right? So we can think about um, Addis Ababa in terms of, a, a, you know, land that was um, inhabited by, um, you know, farmers primarily, Oromo farmers, and then the ways oh. in which that land then becomes um, part of a modernist project um, that is going to insert Ethiopia into an international system, the ways in which we have a revolution and that early modern project, you know, of Haile Selassie and Middle League is rejected, and we have a new modern project of the Derg, and then that gets erased, and we have a new modern project. And I'm actually really interested in the way the modern keeps on getting evoked in Addis, huh. and, and then it gets banished, and it's become, it's old, it becomes old fashioned. And this is why I'm interested in the idea of a modernist ruin as well. So I, I actually want to tell the story of these multiple erasures and reinscriptions and these multiple displacements, displacements of people, like who, who gets displaced every time one of these modernist projects gets um, undertaken, right? Oh. Um, so I'm trying to think about who is, um, you know, on the land when Addis Ababa is founded, who gets displaced from the land um, as these different projects um, go on. But it, and the diasporic aspect is that I also, I'm interested in like who leaves the country as well. like you know, the Addis Ababa citizens who then, like, you know, my parents, for instance, um, who um, have to leave the city and, and also what is that, what, what does Addis Ababa become through the, their relationship with the city? So it's, a, it's really multidimensional, this, this, um, this second project. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It sounds absolutely fascinating. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I, it's been a pleasure to host you here at the University of Washington. I want to remind our audience again to post their questions in the Q&A box. I must reluctantly now turn the mic back over to Leela, and I hope our conversations continue in the yeah, future. Thank fine. you again. We'll, we'll hang out soon, Hamza. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Hamza. Um, and thank you, Santeem, for such an amazing talk. So we have lots of questions piling up. Um, I've, I'm, part of my job is to, to do them in an order, which um, is manageable. And I, I think I'll start with one. Um, which could be useful because we have a very broad audience tuning in. Um, could you expand for those who are not familiar with details of the ongoing war 
how the 1974 revolution continues to emerge in the present? Sure. Um, so, I mean, what I document in my book is um, a student movement that um, produces a literature in the 1960s and 70s that attempts to answer questions about the political economy of Ethiopia and, and political governance in Ethiopia. And they turn to a Marxist literature in order to answer those questions. Um, I would say that uh, for the most part, uh, the 1974 revolution is one iteration of the student movement taking power. But another iteration of the student movement is those who opposed uh, the military uh, junta that uh, came into power after 1974. And so you, you can say in some ways that members of the student movement, um, you know, often went to the bush to fight that military uh, government that was established after 1974. So um, ideas of nations that, that the ways in which Marxism should be expressed in Ethiopia is through the nation's nationalities and peoples of Ethiopia um, was something that was really argued about in the 1960s. Um, and then I would say that, you know, groups like the TPLF, Tigray People's Liberation Front, um, really take on that position and end up opposing the, the 1974 government, um, not by abandoning Marxism, but actually through a kind of different interpretation of how Marxism should play out in Ethiopia. Um, they fought a civil war for 17 years. Um, and the 1994 constitution in Ethiopia reflects the kinds of debates um, and uh, the position of, of, of those students and, and the TPLF, um, you know, in terms of how the nationalities question should play out. So the, the 1994 constitution, which is still the constitution that uh, governs uh, supposedly relationships in Ethiopia today is done in the name of the nation's nationalities and peoples of Ethiopia. It devolves power to uh, you know, the different regions of Ethiopia. It's a federal system. Um, people often make the remark that, that the devolution of that power is one um, that reinforces the category of the ethnic group um, because the the devolution is 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 down to the nations and the nationalities and peoples um, and so I would say that the present uh, conflict in many ways is about um, the legacy of the student movement the legacy of that constitution in many ways it's a rejection of that constitution it's also very much a rejection of um, the ideas that animated the student movement and I would say that there's a kind of embarrassment around that that generation and what they did, and there's an and as I said um, earlier, there's an attempt to reinscribe a different kind of modernist project onto the landscape of Ethiopia today. Is that clear? Yeah, thank you so much. I think that was really, really helpful. But so just kind of building on that um, and sort of how things are, are being reconfigured in the present. One of the questions wants to know if you have any thoughts on um, the expansion of new new communication technologies on the communication of Tizita and how it is expressed today. New communication technologies. I mean, I listen to Tizita primarily on you know through different YouTube videos. So uh, you know the internet was important to my own access of of mm -hmm. the ghosts that um, came to embody me. Um, so in that sense, I think these new technologies play a, um, a role in connecting um, diasporas back to their home communities. Um, I think that the internet, I mean, that's a really large question. I think the internet, I think chat groups, I think t Twitter, I mean, they all play really dramatic roles in the ways in which identity is constituted by the diaspora, um, the Ethiopian diaspora and the, and the ways in which they end up mobilizing politically to, um, to have an effect on politics back in Ethiopia. But I'm not really an expert on that. So I'm not gonna comment beyond that. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. So there's a whole series of questions on um, the way you connected your research with um, your discussion of, of the social sciences. And so I'm gonna start going through them and, and we can kind of build on them as we're, as we're talking. So, um, so they're big, quite, let me warn you, they're big questions, but I think it's because your, your talk um, sparked um, so much um, uh, just so much thought that it provokes so much thought uh, in our colleagues. So the first one um, is saying is, ask, is is noting. Um, thank you, thank you for your talk and saying that 
Mamdani's framework, as you describe, emphasizes how power in, Af in, in Africa continually um, reproduces binaries. Um, do you see your approach through, through uh, to of opening space for seeing the pa in, in the past ways that people have challenged or troubled such binaries? So kind of like how, like if you could talk a little bit about how your approach disrupts that kind of binary model yeah. within the social sciences. Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that I'm really trying to do with Tizita is to think about the relationship between form and content, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm trying to think about the relationship between form and content, I'm also trying to think about how people remember, right? And how you, and so that's, I talk about the past as a mode of transmission, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we need to, to think about that mode of transmission, which means that um, the story that you tell about yourself might be, you know, it might be a good story, but one also needs to like disinvest a little bit from that story in so much as like it, it comes through a particular transmission channel, right? I guess this relates back to the earlier question as well. Um, so if we're thinking about the, that, tr that, that mode of transmission, then um, what Tizita invites us to think about is multiple modes of transmission as well. Um, and in that sense, I'm hoping to overcome some of the binaries that get reproduced over and over again about um, how we how we came to our present. Yeah. That, so in that sense, you know, Tizita locates me in a particular place, and this is why it's not just a neutral position, right? It's actually very much what I am here right now in a particular place, and I'm making a claim about the past based on you know how I got here. But I recognize that there are other people who got here and, and constitute my position as well, right? And, and so I'm trying to open up a dialogue uh, through locating myself as having a particular position, right? The dialogue is not one where I come from a place of, I don't have a position or I'm innocent or I'm objective. There's none of that going on in the work, right? I, my sense is that to, to make a claim about objectivity is to reproduce the binaries, is to reproduce the violence, in fact. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you're, talking, you're, you're talking about writing a kind of embodied history, right? Yeah. And, and one of the questions, uh, uh, if I'll just connect that comment to one of the questions from, again, one of our colleagues, who's asking like, how, if you could think, uh, and maybe you've done this already, um, how, how, how do you, um, or how could you in, um, incorporate that within um, how social science methodology is being taught? Because social science methodology still is, and I'm, I'll be a little undiplomatic here, it's still fairly uh, mainstream in terms of the, the training we give our students. And, and, and so how would you teach students? Like how would you train students to, to work on this kind of embodied historical writing? I, I, I think one of the things to really think about is, you know, where does the social sciences even come from, right? And where does this idea of neutrality come from mm -hmm. um, and objectivity? And I think that we can re we can really locate that in a particular moment within kind of European social theory, right? And um, European social theory has its own critique of that type of yeah. objectivity itself. It's not that I, Santin, just made that up today, right? Um, so I think we need to, if we're going to teach a course on methods, then we need to think historically about where methods come from, rather than thinking about mm -hmm. methods as just like a toolbox that anybody can like pick up and apply. You know, why does this tool exist? Where does it come from? Um, what what kind of history? What are what are the conditions of possibility for this tool to exist? Um, and to 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 do critique from that vantage point as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of what I'm I'm arguing about is that the social sciences, you know, has coincides with transformations in capitalist social relations. And in, in, a, in fact, the social sciences is an attempt to grapple with the ways in which uh, capitalism has changed in Europe itself and the ways in which the economic and the political have been separated to some degree, um, mm -hmm. at least at the level of appearance it's been separated, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the social sciences is really trying to both grapple with that separation, but it's also fixated on limiting its analysis to that space that is uh, created by that separation. So I think by historicizing these things, we can teach our students to, um, to think better about what method is, yeah. Thank you so much for that. And if you don't mind, I'm just gonna ask you to, um, I'm gonna ask you to follow up on that with a little bit of a twist of that question. So one of the things we're grappling with with the speaker series is how to think about um, concepts of citizenship, race, um, uh, protest 
in ways that um, both engage with diasporic um, relationships and the connections across regions and nations, um, um, as well as to connect, um, you know, movements around race or, or sort of transformative movements with the U.S. with what you know, transformative movements in in parts of Africa. And so, I'm, I guess I'm wondering, in, in your critique of the social sciences, um, how do you engage with some of the um, similar, because you, you talked about the fact that there are these critiques in, in, in the Western Academy too, right? So how do you engage with or see Tizita in relationship, for example, to like his uh, um, intellectual histories um, in, in say, let, let's say feminist scholarship, which have also re sought to rethink objectivity, you know, for example, so you think of Sandra, Sandra Harding's idea of strong objectivity, or you could think of, um, uh, Hamza has a question about black studies, so for example, uh, scholarship that has taught, talked about social location and knowledge production. So are those critiques which come in some ways are part of a Western tradition in, in, many, in many ways, I mean, they're a critical sort of transformative aspect of, of Western tradition. Um, are there connections with Tizita? Are there differences that we would want to explore to, to deepen you know, our understandings? So rather than going from, rather than just thinking of this as West versus Africa, what about those nuances and those connections? Sure. I mean, I actually don't really like, I, I try to not spend too much time uh, on a critique of Eurocentrism um, mm -hmm. because I don't actually find that very productive. Mm -hmm. um, I am more interested in what, um, what, what is critique. Um, and I find lots of different traditions helpful in terms of thinking about what critique is. Um, I'm also... I would say that I locate my own work within the tradition of the Frankfurt School. Uh, and when I'm talking about Frankfurt School here, I'm talking about early Frankfurt School. So Adorno, uh, you know, Horkheimer, uh, Marcuse are really, really important to my work. Um, and in a way, I, I probably arrived at Tizita. I mean, I, I spent a lot of my childhood listening to Tizita at various, you know, sessions that my parents would have. But the articulation of Tizita that you're hearing today is also in dialogue with my reading of people like Adorno, his, his um, essay subject and object, I think is really important to me. Um, Horkheimer's um, essay, What is Critical Theory, is also really important to what I'm doing. Um, so so I, 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 I see Tizita as extending that tradition rather than being a kind of exclusive uh, club of, of African knowledge production, right? And, and for me, I actually see people like Horkheimer as, and, and Adorno, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not even sure how one even sees them as your, like they're inside of Europe, but they're also like, you know, critiquing Europe and, and they have a marginal position within Europe itself. So I think we also need to um, disaggregate what we what we think of as Europe as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you but so I will, much. I will also say, you know, and this came up with a student a few weeks ago who was like, why can't we just think about Africa in terms of Africa? I was like, because no African ever thought about themselves as African until Europe showed up. Right. <laughs> so I do think a critical history of Europe is really important to understanding African realities. So Thank yeah. you so much for that. Um, and so let me let me just then build on this because uh, with another another couple of questions, um, which I think connect to this. So um, these questions are talking about um, how how people are responding to your, the history of writing. So one question is, um, how are students involved in politics responding to your history of the Ethiopian student movement, for example? How are students where? Students in Ethiopia, students here. Uh, so he, the question doesn't specify, so I let you go either way with that. Uh, I, I mean, think, I, yeah, I, th I think I think students in Ethiopia, if I were to guess. Sure. So I'm not, you know, I think that my book is engaged, has been engaged by Ethiopian academics um, and you know intellectuals, also people who are part of the student movement. So I've presented uh, my work. Um, you know, at a kind of meeting where there was a lot of uh, former members of the student movement from the 60s and 70s. Um, I think people are, they're, they're, there's a positive response for the most part. I mean, I think that this is a very fraught history. And um, part of what I'm trying to do is negotiate the ways in which it's fraught. So I'm not sure that 
you know, somebody's going to come out and say, hey, this is amazing or, you know, it's not because it, the book isn't really asking that kind of question. I'm not I'm not looking for that kind of response. I'm, I'm looking for reflection and um, an attempt to pause and think about something that's let's you know, is fraught and is lived in a, in a very complicated way today. Yeah. Yeah, and so kind of just building on that, there's another question from the audience asking about how, uh, asking whether in what ways Tizita itself might be rooted in particular cultural traditions and how, what does that mean uh, in terms of ethnically het heterogeneous countries um, where, where, where they might be sort of, you know, internal relationships of power and domination. So as you're thinking of Tizita as decolonizing knowledge, are there other kinds of hierarchies of knowledge, production and cultural tradition? that yeah clearly uh, clearly there's other there's other yeah. um linked to, the, link to the link to the tradition of tizita i guess is the question right i mean sure i mean i'm, I'm i i said at some point that relationality is not romantic for me mm -hmm. right that relation re relationality embodies histories of violence and histories of domination um mm -hmm. but what I do insist on is that I start from my own positionality, right? And that, that, that is the only place that I can start from, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to start from my positionality, I start from what I know and, and, and Tizita then becomes a tool for me to think about the ways in which history has been transmitted. I'm not attempting to assert Tizita as like um, a kind of universal category that then, you mm -hmm. know, can be mechanized and, and then you know, made into a tool for, you know, that kind of useful history that we were talking about in my, in my talk earlier, right? That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm actually suggesting that there's a capacity for reflexivity um, within, um, within Amharic and within um, uh, a tradition that I was born into. And I'm inviting uh, people to engage with that capacity for reflexivity um, as a way to disinvest in some ways, from their own identity as 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 one thing, right? Mm -hmm. I think I think that's really important about what I'm doing because I mean, the Tizita is a way to divest from from the self as um, singular or bounded, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I think that's really interesting. And again, you know, many of your thoughts are kind of uh, in your answers are, are connecting to questions which are piling up. And so I link this to what you just said to one specific question, which is just gonna ask you to just reflect more. Um, so just speak more about it basically. And the question is asking um, about Tizita, um, um, just reflecting on how important what you're talking about is in, in terms of the problem of decolonizing African studies and then asking whether your aesthetic approach is a specific method uh, intended as a technique, a method for study that could apl be applied to other studies or is it is it specific to your own embodied study, and and I'll just add my own uh, uh, comments because you were also talking about uni uni universality, right? You were talking about Tizita as a universal process earlier in your talk, so maybe some just some, you know, and th these are as you know huge questions. So basically, just take it in whatever direction you want, which, whichever piece of it you'd like to. Sure. So I don't actually say Tizita is a, is universal. What I say is that it invites us to to um, it invites us to be self-reflexive. What I do insist on is that there is no universal that can be found out there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, so that the universal is something that you pull out from the particular, right? The, the, the particular then is an embodiment of an entire history, right? The particular is an embodiment of a set of relationship. And I pull out the universal from that particular because it helps me to think about the relationality that is is exists in me as a body but actually if I take myself seriously it shows that I am not bounded in time and space right mm -hmm. um you know it's much the same way you know why does Marx start capital with tables and chairs right he doesn't start with the category capital he starts with ch tables and chairs and he asks like why how can we have this thing tables and chairs, like, you know, and I'm like, how can we have Santi, right? Um, and he pulls out the universality of capitalism by starting from the particular, right? So by the time we get to the end of, of Capital Volume One, we're, we're thinking about the history of colonialism and imperialism, right? But he starts from a very simple point, which is 
how do how, what are the conditions of possibility to have a table and chair what is the relationship between tables and chairs right and 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 i suppose that's sort of what i'm doing as well in my book right um so it's it's imminent critique you start from where you are and then you build critique outwards rather than starting outwards and then building critique in into into yourself right um what what was the other question that you asked me i i, I think i've forgotten <laughs> i think i might have forgotten too um let me go back to it let's see i think it was it was asking whether it was a, a specific method because it, because of the way you're talking about aesthetics right and so yeah there's definitely a method there there's like there's some there's a vibe <laughs> um, um I, there's something about form that i'm doing like there's there's something in the performance of this talk the way that i wrote it the the playing with poetry and poetics that is obviously thought about i'm not just like talking out of my out of my head I'm, i am thinking about aesthetics here and I'm, I'm trying to match my performance and um the way i'm presenting my material with this idea of tivita as well and with the call for reflexivity that i am um talking about in 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 the paper that i just delivered yeah yeah, mm -hmm. that's really interesting. And I guess I'll add one of my own questions. And this may make, if it makes no sense, you could just skip it. But um, in many ways, you're also playing around with questions of time, right? Temporality. Uh, when you're talking about the, the past being embodied in the present and how you're writing history. But you're also, you're also talking a lot about change because when you're talking about sort of the failures and histories of revolution. So I guess I'm, I'm interested, interested to hear about the, the third part. You know, you talked about the present and the past. I'm interested to hear about the future. Um, and I'm just thinking this, and this is just happens to be in my, my mind. I'm just thinking about how within certain Sufi traditions, um, the, the teaching is that it's not just that you, you uh, are trying to change things in the future, but if you change the future, you actually change the past, right? So there's, you know, other kinds of cultural and mystical traditions, time is not linear in the same way. So I'd love, I'd love to hear what, you think your your understandings of the past and present mean for how you think about change and, and transformation in the future? Huh. So, I mean, I, I think that I reject any notion of really like dwelling too much on the future, to be honest. Mm -hmm. If I if I do imminent critique, then um, the future is produced through through that imminent critique, right? It's, it's through exploding um, the past into the present and and then through that ex explosion um you know seeing what new configurations come about mm -hmm. rather than um engaging in some kind of normative project about what the future should be or mm -hmm. engaging with a kind of like yeah i mean my whole critique in fact of, of the ways in which the student movement um is able to take a technocratic approach to politics is because they're so obsessed with a future that they can fashion, mm -hmm. right? Rather than actually turning their back somewhat to the future and thinking about what, where are they right now, um, and how 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 do we re, how do we refashion what we have? And 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 that's why I say that I'm not interested in the question of you know what does it mean for me to live with you know, my enemy in the future, I'm much more interested in, well, how have we constituted our present today? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if we take that seriously, what emerges? And that's unpredictable. That's not something that we can manage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. And so then, you know, uh, the questions that keep that they're, they're, they're still coming, so I'm just going to keep reading. So, so this building on what you just said, um, one of the questions is asking then, um, are there ways of engaging the social, the state, or political um, without, and particularly in Africa, without reprodu re reproducing the violence that is being contested? Or is that a normative question? I'll add my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> without reproducing the violence? I don't even know what to do with that question. <laughs> okay. I have no idea. I mean, aren't we always reproducing the violence? I mean, that's the thing about how we are here right now is mm -hmm. that, so the question isn't so much without reproducing the violence, but minimizing the violence or thinking self, mm -hmm. self thinking self reflexive, reflex, what's the word I want? Thinking reflexively about that violence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think the position of nonviolence is not necessarily about erasing it because that becomes its own violence as well, right? It's about how do we minimize it? 
um, yeah, that's that would be my answer. <laughs> yeah, you know these are these are heavy, these are really heavy questions, right? <laughs> yeah, people are, people obviously had a lot of coffee today because the questions are really deep. So um, so just another this is kind of it's basically linked to everything you're talking about. So it's a question asking. Um, is useful, usable history something that your students at Columbia bring to your classes? And how do you teach them something else through the, through the Ethiopian story? Sure, I do think that the idea of a usable past, which is something that actually dominated African studies for a long time, um, is something that students do bring to the class. And um, something that I do try to disabuse them of, but I think when I try to disabuse my students of that, they often think that I'm doing this thing of, oh, well, we can take an, a neutral and objective position. And, and I think I'm trying to get my students to be open to like different methods of storytelling and narrativizing and to really think about why that's important um, for, for the kinds of politics they may think they have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a struggle. And I think it's a struggle because people when they come to African studies they want an object they're like there's problems in Africa and I want to address them and if what I'm doing is saying hey slow down like let's actually think about you know this object that you want people get can be really frustrated right because they're like well I want the damn object I'm here and I paid you know whatever thousands of dollars for the for the African object I'm like but you know storytelling matters and narrative matters and mm -hmm. you know what is, what is a self-reflexive um, you know, method that means that you move away from the object and, and start to, you know, think differently about what Africa is. I think it's really difficult. And I think Africa is really overdetermined. Like people think they really know what Africa is. And so to, to disabuse people of the idea of what is Africa um, and to say, hey, maybe this object is not so self-evident is really, it can be really problematic um, when, teaching, when teaching African studies. Yeah. And, and so now I'm just curious. Um, so how, like, how do you how do you do that in the classroom with storytelling? Like, do you um, what do you, what do you do with the students? How do, you, how do you how do you shake them out of it? You know, oh my gosh, what is my method in my in my classes? Uh, I try to get them to read lots of different kinds of texts, but I also really try to get them to think about. Uh, I get them to read authors that are thinking about aesthetics, that are thinking about narrative. So when we do ethnographies, for instance, most of the ethnographies that I get them to read are ones where the author is really posing the question of what, not just what ethnography is, but what it means to write an ethnography, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is that can be really revealing to students, although again, it takes time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, I think, I keep on coming back to the question of what does it mean to write Africa? Um, that's, that's the question I keep on posing with my students. And sometimes they get it. <laughs> and I'm just, I'll ask one, these are just my own questions. So I'll ask one more. So is, an anti, is there an anti-theory bias among students? Do they feel like the theory pulls them away from the thing called Africa? I do or, think, yeah. I do think so. And I think, like I said, I think Africa is really a problem because somehow the, pro, the you know, Af the, 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 the crisis of Africa is pressing, right? Um, so we have to get to work. Um, and um, there is a sense that um, there's some kind of urgency. Um, yeah, I think Africa is really an overdetermined ob object that people feel that they can just get their hands on quite easily. And I'm making things far too complicated with all of these multiple voices and multiple narratives and so on, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So you, you've been very patient with all of these really um, um, heavy and complicated questions. I guess I'll, I'll end with one last question and ask you um, to talk a little bit about, about um, what, what you're, you're, you're working on right now. Sure. I mean, it's that project that I just talked about, uh, about Addis Ababa. I mean, Hamza had asked me that question. Yes. Earlier, right? Do I, I don't need to repeat myself. Okay. <laughs> all right. That's a good question. Okay, well, let me close now and I'll, I'll just thank you for all of your patience uh, in answering all of these questions. And so once I um, end it, I won't get to see you again because of the Zoom technology, but I thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to everybody who came. Yeah, bye.